My name is Amanda Gilmore, and I work on the Heroku Postgres team, where I write a lot of SQL, understandably. And um, one of the nice things about running so many databases at scale is you got to see a lot of things. You get to see a lot of different schema types, and you got to see a lot, lot of quirks, like if you're migrating a database or, or things like that. Um, and I've had the interesting advantage of seeing quirks and learn how to deal with them. And one of those quirks is that you can put rich data in Postgres. Um, I don't know if all y'all were here for the industry summit um, on Monday morning, but there was a panel about um, bridging the divide between Postgres and NoSQL in industry. Um, so this is a thing a lot of people are talking about and using um, as evidenced by like the foreign data wrapper features and things like that. So, um, but the thing is, if you're in a Postgres mindset, that can be a bit of a challenge, right? Like if you're used to thinking of data in a very relational way, it can be tricky to know what document you could use the best for your application. Um, at one point I was uh, at the office and one of my colleagues had a friend over and they were talking about um, how their partner was starting to use Mongo and how uh, this person was like, oh, there's no joins, I don't know how you do it, like what's going on? And I, I happened to be there and I'm like, hey, actually I'm on, I'm on the data team, I can uh, help with this. Um, and the, the, the short answer is if you're thinking about joining, that's not quite how that works, you're thinking about it in a weird way. So I am here to show you both how to think about that data, what kinds of applications are going to be best suited to what rich data type, and show you some ways that you can query on those rich data types. Um, because that's also important, right? Like you don't want to pick a data type that's kind of a pain in the tuchus to work with. You want something your developers are going to enjoy and you yourself are going to enjoy working with. So I'm going to go on over that. Um, and one of the things I love about Postgres is that it does give you a lot of options, right? Like if you want to do something with it, chances are it can help you do it. Um, and to that end, it gives you four, though at least four that I'm going over today, it gives you four rich data types. Um, and I'm going to show you how to go over, how to, you know, use these, how to query on each of them. Um, I'm going to, there are four, there's XML, HStore. Um, HStore is a proprietary one that is Postgres specific. Um, XML, you may recall from, you know, RSS feeds, yeah. Um, and uh, also, if you've ever worked with a SOAP API, XML is going to look pretty familiar. If you've never done any front-end dev, it's very um, similar to working with the, the DOM, the doc, um, you know, the, if you're doing front-end dev. Um, I'm going to lump JSON and JSONB together, though, because a lot of the same operators will work for both formats. And the main difference is under the hood. And I'll, um, I'll go over that and how you can um, decide which of those two is going to be best for your application. Um, which is tricky, right? Like, there's so many options. How do you decide what to go with? Um, so I'd like to take you all through some questions that you might want to ask yourself and your team as you're trying to decide on a format. Um, um, so the first question is actually, this quest, the answer to this question makes it pretty straightforward, right? Like, if you are wrapping a foreign database, just pick a data format that closely maps to that database, right? Like, if you're using Mongo, you'll want to use BS or JSON because, you know, that, that, mar that language is already derived from JSON anyway. So it's straight mapping, it's really easy. Um, if you're working with Redis, key value, go with HStore. Um, so I'm going to go into how to query those in a little bit. Um, some other edge casey things is like maybe you do have a normal object schema that is well represented by a relational database, right? And this is something actually that I encounter a lot in my current work, where it's a nice object model, a lot of stuff like works with single table inheritance, but you got some weird attributes, right? Excuse me, there's no table for water. Um, so an example of this that um, I like to offer is like if you're building a catalog for rental cars, right? Um, like you don't want a column for each option because there are a lot of them. You can have power windows, power steering, maybe it's a manual transmission. You don't want a column for each of those and you also don't want like a table that connects on an ID. So you can have a rich document that represents those attributes and save yourself a lot of time and energy. Um, and this actually more closely represents what I do with my daily work. I mean, I've used all of these formats, but this is the one I use the most. Um, now, another really important thing to consider here is that um, you can dump your data as a blob into a row and it will live very happily there. But if you're performing a lot of operations on it, um, it will still lock your row. So if all of your data is in one row and you're using it as a document, you might want to consider 
possibly wrapping a foreign database, for example, or as I'll show you, breaking it out into separate rows. So um, rich data is very powerful, but it does have limitations when you're applying it to Postgres. So the idea is to understand what tools are good for the job, because um, you can't, if the, the lock contention will still be there if you're editing a JSON object, for example. Um, I'm gonna go in reverse chronological order, um, just in terms of like what you might encounter, um, which puts us at XML first. Um, you like XML? I love XML, honestly. I like. I think that the X path is like really easy. Like I find it to be super intuitive. But I used to do a lot of like front end automation development, so like that makes sense. Um, but it's also going to depend on like your team's culture, right? Like if that's intuitive to you, roll with it. Um, so uh, here's how you make a table. Pretty straightforward. I'm sure you've all seen that before. Um, I have a nice handy empty database right over here that I made for this demo. It's got no tables in it yet. We will add those. Um, so I'm gonna go on ahead and add a table right here. Doo, doo, doo. Boom, we have a table. Now we can put data in that um, and query on it. So uh, if we go on over here, there are a couple of ways that you can add data with XML. Um, so this one's a little bit more complicated. Um, this is if I'm bulk inserting an entire XML object into the database. And as you can see, I've got a version header here. Um, and what this is doing is it's saying XML parse. So I'm passing Postgres a function so that it knows it's getting the whole shebang right here. It's getting the header, it's getting everything. And it knows how to do that, do that with this XML parse function. Um, alternatively, this takes a content argument. Right now I'm showing it with document because I think that's the powerful part about this function is it knows how to deal with everything. Um, I've truncated this because it's kind of a behemoth of um, a document, um, but let me show you that. So if we go on over here, um, I have an entire XML document that I shamelessly yoinked from MSDN. Um, and uh, actually, um, at the end, I'm going to have links and references too, and the links and references to that will be in the readme. Um, all of these code samples you're seeing is on GitHub. So um, don't, I, I, I got your back. Like, have you ever been like in a talk and you're like frantically trying to get a picture with your camera and you hate, like, yeah, yeah, I see, yeah, I hate that. Um, I got your back. You can go into GitHub and get all this later. You don't need to worry about the, the camera or anything like that. Um, so this is an entire document. Um, it's using that XML parse function. I'm gonna go on ahead and stick that in our database. Boom, now we have data, it's great. Select all the data. Ah, thank you. I'm wearing contacts right now. I never wear contacts. They're kind of fuzzy at close range. Boom. Um, and I really like that it pretty prints this. Um, not all of the formats do that, but XML does, and that makes me happy. Um, so you can see that. But the thing is, like, the power of a document-oriented database is that you don't want to just bulk query everything, right? You want to drill down in there. And you can do that with XML, too. Um, so in order to demonstrate that a bit more effectively, I'm gonna add several records with a different node. So um, as you can see, this is like a book catalog, right? Um, which is the thing I've worked on happily. Um, I've worked in libraries, they're lots of fun. Um, I've had to solve technical solutions for libraries. Um, they're nice folks, librarians. So um, I'm gonna go on ahead, put this data in here, and then we have something to play with. Um, and as you'll see, as good programmers are, I'm lazy. Uh, what did I call that database, pgconf, the f flag. Do you ever use this f flag? This thing is awesome, I love this f flag. Um, it's really handy if I'm like messing around in the console to like really work out some complicated SQL and then I can stick it in a text file and then put it in later, it's great. Um, so now I have tons of data in here that I can query with. And this is what it's gonna look like. I'm gonna have one row with a book in there. So. Um, let me show you some of those XPath functions that make this really powerful. Um, so like I mentioned, if you're ever, you know, if you've ever done front end dev, you're used to like an XML or an XPath type format, you can use this function to query just like an XPath. And uh, what this will do is it'll get as a string all of the items at this node in the XPath. Let me go on down here. Boom. Actually, let me turn on, there we go. Yeah, now you can see what we got. 
Um, and you'll recall that because the first thing I added was an entire document, that first row has all of the titles. So if I did opt for an architecture that had bigger blobs, this function helps me out so I can still use that data. Um, reading is easier. I mean, I don't need to worry about the lock contention, obviously. So like, if you're doing a read-heavy application, this, oop, ah, no, don't do that. If I'm doing a read-heavy application, this could be a great way to go right here. If I'm doing something that's a bit more operation heavy, maybe I want to do this. It's up to you. Um, other th fun things that you can do, um, excuse me. Um, so you'll note here that like that's an array, right? Like you've got this little uh, bracket situation because of course in this case, I have a lot of things that this query is returning. So Postgres helpfully gives this back to me as an array. So if I only want information for one record, I can traverse that, or I can uh, use an index to pull out the data that I need, just like here. Um, so if I'm looking by title, for example, I can say I just want the first thing out of that array. So here, let me go on down. Do, do, do. Do, do, do. Sorry. There we go. I've got all the data just for that one record, um, and I have used that array uh, operator to pull it out of here. So uh, yeah, pretty powerful stuff. Updating, on the other hand, is not a thing you can do natively with XPath. Uh -uh. Um, so if, like I said, like if I, I, I would recommend X, or, you know, XML if you're doing something really read heavy. Um, another nice use case for XML, like um, back in the day, I used to work with um, a credit card processing API that um, it was a SOAP API. Um, so let's say I wanted to process that information asynchronously, like dump all the data and then deal with it later. Um, that could be a good use case for XML. Like I can just dump it in the database and deal with it later. Anything else that's read heavy, this is a really great data type for that, especially if you find that X path to be really intuitive. This could be a good one. Updates, not so much. Um, I should caveat that by saying you can update it, but it takes a third party library. Um, which is kind of outside the scope of this talk, unfortunately. I could go down a lot of rabbit holes if I went into uh, third-party libraries. Excuse me a sec. <coughs> yeah, HStores. HStores are fun. These are, uh, speaking of things that are native to Postgres, HStores are specific in Postgres. This is a, a Postgres-specific format that first came out with version 9.1. Um, and it's kind of handy because it's a straight key value store so it is really intuitive, you know. Um, excuse me. On the other hand, it's a string under the hood. So if you're trying to do, let's say, comparisons to other data types, you have to do an explicit cast, um, which I will confess kind of tripped me up when I first started getting into this data type, you know, like. I guess it shouldn't have, because I like being explicit, but you know, you do have to be very explicit with this data type, um, which is not necessarily the case with some of the others, as I'll show you. Um, the other thing that can be a bit of a trick is that um, HStore is native, but it's native as what's called a contrib module, which you may or may not have heard of, but um, it's, it's an extension, but it comes out of the box, so you don't need to download anything to install it. Um, so if I were to go on over here, let's close that out and try and create that table without creating the extension, Postgres will be sad, and it throws fits. So if I create the extension explicitly beforehand, everything is copacetic. Dun, dun, dun. There we go. Um, so let's stick some data in here. Um, we have a schema, um, and as mentioned, this data is just a string, um, so it's pretty easy to read. You've got the nice comma thing going on, the little uh, apostrophe thing to show that it is just a string. Um, this, is, this is shamelessly yoinked from my staging environment because good programmers are lazy. Um, and uh, I, yeah, this is um, just like if I had a formation of databases, that's what this represents right here. Um, so that's from my staging. And I'm going to put that into the database, and we'll do a little bit of testing with it. Oh, haha. <laughs> Boom. Um, now, again, that's not super helpful. Let's stick a bunch of records in here. 
I've got several HStore samples here. Copy that file path. pgconf f. Boom. So great. Look at all this efficiency. Um, let's query some stuff now. Um, so as mentioned, if you want to make a comparison to this data to something else, it does require an explicit cast. So here I am casting this to an integer. Um, I'm checking to see if I have large-ish, relatively speaking, large-ish resources. Um, so let's go on ahead and try that out. Boom. Um, that's not larger and equal to, so it gives me everything except the one resource that is 30 megs, which is here. So I've got a bunch. Um, you can also, if you wish, um, I don't know about all y'all, but like when I'm querying, I frequently do the like the slash DT thing to like check what I'm doing as I'm querying, kind of like a frequent, all right, what am I working with? What am I working with? Um, I also do that if I'm working with H stores because it's very helpful to see what do I have to work with, what do I have to compare to as I'm crafting my queries. Um, this little function here will just give me everything in that table. It'll give me all of the records that have this particular key. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Meh, that's okay. Let's look at this one first. Cool. So let's say I'm looking to query on a key, right? Um, I don't need anything else, I'm just interested in a particular key. Boom. Um, actually, interesting note. Uh, so like, as resource name. Since I'm doing this cast, you'll note that it calls the column text, so I have to explicitly name my column if I wanna see something, like make something useful out of that. Now, um, that's just, that's not particularly useful information on its own. Oh, hey, I have a question, what's up? Uh, can you increase the size of your terminal? I certainly can, my sincere apologies. Thank you for asking. There we go, how's that? Great. I am big into uh, Sublime Text, but I forgot that uh, whenever you open a new terminal window, it doesn't, it doesn't get um, bigger on its own, so thank you. How's that, that better? Cool. Sweet. Um, so yeah, this is not terribly useful on its own, right? Um, let's ask for some more columns to make more sense of this information. Um, if we go on down here, I can also ask, all right, which of these resources are active? Which of my nodes are still kicking? They're still doing stuff. Um, so as you'll see, I'm not querying any additional columns. I'm querying the same column, just my documents column, which is where the document data lives. Cool, so this is a little more useful. Now I can get an overview of which uh, resources in my formation are doing their thing, which ones are happy. Oh, I didn't, uh, let me rename that too, as status. Yeah. Boom. Um, now, uh, in comparison to, say, XML, one of the nice things about HStore is that you can update things. Um, you can't quite do it in place, literally. Um, like this is sort of, um, how do I put it? Like one of the, one of the things to, that's important to remember about this is that like many programming languages, you can't add duplicate values for the same key. It will, it will not be happy. Um, the way Postgres handles this is it takes the second value. So if I add two items that are active resource and true, um, Postgres will discard the first one, it'll take this, the second one, um, thinking it's the most recent one, I guess. Um, so in that case, that's how you update a thing with HStore, is you use this concat operator, um, which seemed a little weird and counterintuitive, but once you understand how it's working under the hood, it makes a little more sense. So here, I'm updating the value of active resource, um, specifically where documents and I'm using a containment operator here because again, remember, this is just a string. Or I'm sorry, this is just text. Let me not be imprecise. This is just text. So if I can say, hey, does this piece of text contain another sub piece of text? That's how I can ensure I'm updating the right thing. I only want to update, for example, the resource name that has this name, swimming swiftly. Um, 
interesting aside, um, so like, if you want to ensure that you're not doing the wrong thing, you can add indexes on these. So if I wanted to add a not null um, I, on these, I'm pretty sure you can do that, um, which is nice because like it's a key value, it's a blob, but like Postgres still has your back, right? Like it won't let you do any, as long as you tell it what you want the rules to be, you can't overwrite a thing that you don't want to. Um, so I'm gonna go on ahead and show you that containment operator, which is really nice over here. Um, also note, I'm explicitly casting this to an H store because Again, I, I will keep repeating this. This is just a string, um, or this is just text, huh, just text. Boom, and this updates two things in our database. So if I go on ahead and rerun this query, now I can see that some of my resources have been marked as no longer active. Um, now, let us go on to the fun ones, JSON and J. Well, they're all fun. I think they're all fun. This one is, uh, how shall we put it? This one's a bit more complicated. Um, there are certainly more operators available to you. Um, I like to think of it as combining the best of both worlds, really. Oh, dear me, excuse me. Random aside, I was reading an interview with um, voice actors who were talking about how like it really wears your voice out if you're talking all day and like now that I do talks it's like man I totally understand where they're coming from like you need to drink water all the time um, so thank you for bearing with me um, JSON and JSONB are very exciting um, this is more closely resembling what you would see in Mongo for example um, I think if you're wrapping Cassandra this would probably be a good fit as well um, Cassie's pretty cool um, now the big difference between JSON and JSONB that's very important is that JSON is just text. Again, like HStore, it's just text. The JSONB is a binary formatted data, so you can do like B tree indexing, which is pretty cool. Um, there's some other cool things, and um, I'll show that as I go. Um, let me first go over some of the operators because there are a ton of them for JSON. Um, and I'd also encourage you, I'd encourage you to do this for all of the data types, but I would definitely encourage you to go look at the Postgres documentation and get a sense of those operators, because um, there are a ton. Um, and they're a handy quick reference. So you may recall um, when we were looking at HStore that um, we had this little arrow operator here to connect our key and our value. Um, you can do the same thing with JSON, except the beautiful thing about JSON is that you can have like deeply nested objects and um, they get pretty complicated. Um, so in order to use that, you would just access that by chaining these together. So like index item, index item, array value, index item, ad nauseum, and that's cool. Um, the big difference between these two is that this gets the JSON object by text. Um, so if I'm you know, checking containment, this is the thing you're gonna want. Um, this is handy also because this checks if the key even exists, which can also help be helpful, right? Like if there's no key there at all, you're not gonna wanna bother querying on it or perhaps it'll break your query. So you can use that to check. Um, let's go on ahead and add a table. And here I've added a column called text.json or about, I am about to add, you will see me add it. I have a column called text.json and I have a column called binary JSON. And I'm gonna do that to help me more easily illustrate the comparison between those two data formats and how the operators behave with both of them respectively. So let's go on ahead over and do that. Oop, there we go. We have a table stick stuff in the table. Um, so this is the text JSON. And um, you may ask what's the benefit of using text JSON if binary JSON, um, you know, it has these benefits, right? Like you can add the B tree index, you can, it's, it's generally faster. Um, so why would you do that? Well, I, I would say the short answer is don't, um, unless you have like a legacy application that has some special constraints. Because um, we all have snowflakes, it's, it's, it's fine, nothing to be ashamed of, they can be a pain, but they, they're there. Um, so if you have a legacy application with some special constraints that needs it to be text, then you might want to go with it. Um, alternatively, in much the same way as like the XML, right? If you're dealing with just string, you have an application that's not terribly write heavy, you're just reading it, and then manipulating that data at the application layer, 
Yeah, you could get away with JSON text, but generally I strongly advise JSON B. It's better and the operators play more nicely with it. Um, but um, one of the nice things JSON, the text JSON format does do is it ensures that your JSON object is well formed um, and it will, it will not be happy.